When my children were young, it was my goal to raise them to become capable. I knew I wouldn't always be around to take care of them, so I wanted them to become young adults who weren't afraid to confront problems and be ready to step up to solve them. This can be a challenge for parents because while we want them to be smart problem solvers, we also love to do things for our children, especially if our own parents didn't do much for us. But doing for our kids is not loving them, and teaching kids to become capable can be hard. Let me offer you some tips on how to raise capable children. What comes to mind for me first when I think of capable children is those national nanny, nanny shows. Have you seen those when the nanny goes in and tries to implement change? One of the things that the, the scenes that I've seen often is the child who is told to put on their own socks. We're talking about young kids. And the nanny is there to tell the parents, don't do anything and let the child put on her own socks. And she has a meltdown. She's absolutely going ballistic because she has to do something for herself for the very first time. And when I, when I look at that kind of thing on TV and the parents start to get mad, the anger rises up because the child's thrown a fit. Well, the child is basically doing that because they've been trained to do that. When, you, when the child has something that's been done over and over for them, they expect more of it. Teachers suffer from this quite a bit. Oftentimes, teachers will see children who who come to them and say, I like it when you do it for me. And it drives teachers absolutely crazy because they want kids to be capable and it's difficult. So rule number one and tip number one for raising capable children is to, is to stop doing too much for them. There's things that they should be doing for themselves. Now it can be very difficult for some parents because they don't like not doing something for the kids because they feel like they're moving themselves out of a job. But I'm telling you, it's far more effective if we let our kids do things that they should be doing. The, the, another thing to remember is, well, let me offer uh, another example. I remember one time when my uh, kids would leave something at home and they'd call me up from the school office. Dad, I left my project on the dining room table. And I'd go, okay, sweetheart. Of course, my two oldest were girls, so daddies loved to run to the rescue of their daughters. I'd find myself leaving my job, risking my job, and going home to pick up the project or the lunch money or their, their gym sneakers, whatever it was, and running them to school. <laughs> that made me feel powerful and important. And then I realized, what was I teaching my children? That someone will always be there to rescue them. So I, I got my children together and I laid down the law. And I said, guys and gals, Dad's new rule is that I'm not coming to bring things to you at school anymore. So if you've forgotten something, you're just going to have to deal with it. So I asked my kids, what's Dad's new rule? And they said, yes, Dad, you're not going to make us repeat it, are you? And I go, yeah, it's just kind of one of those weird things. I just need to get a confirmation verbally that you heard me. And so they would say something like, fine, Dad, I know from now on you're not going to come to school to bring us stuff. We leave it at, at home. And I go, excellent. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from the office, and my daughter said, Dad, I know you have that new rule, and I promise from now on I'll remember. But can you bring me that project? Because if I don't have it, I'm going to get a bad grade. And of course, oh, the pain inside of me as a dad, because I want to run and make life better and wonderful for my children. And I had to say, no, sweetheart. Daddy's not bringing it to you. I know you'll have a good day. And then the pleading started. And she goes, but dad, please, come on. Don't be a mean dad. I'm going to get a bad grade if I don't have my project. I said, I'm sorry, sweetheart. Daddy's not bringing it to school. You'll have a great day. Goodbye. And I hung up and I wanted to cry so bad because I feel like I failed my children. But that was the tipping point for me when I realized I needed to raise capable children. And I hope you will too. So point number two is let them fail. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to let them experience the worst things in life. Just let them fail and stand back. Now, if the failure is going to hurt them or hurt someone else, you may have to go in temporarily to help them out. But I'm telling you, lay down the rules and then follow through and let them know that you mean what you say and you say what you mean must be consistent on a regular basis and children begin to learn that because it's the failure that is a teaching opportunity for them. And if you rob them of that teaching opportunity, you rob them of growing to become strong, capable children. These, these opportunities also 
bring to mind that every problem has one owner. Now I want to introduce my guest on the set today. It's Jill, is, is part of my crew, and I've asked her to come out here to help me with number three, which every problem has one owner. Um, so what I've asked Jill to do is to pretend to be my daughter. Now the scenario is she was outside playing and she's come in to show me a boo-boo. Now a boo-boo can be either uh, the parent's problem or the child's problem. If, uh, if, now we're gonna make believe that the problem is your elbow and that you, you, you bruised your elbow or something. If Jill's elbow was gashed open and bleeding, it's my problem. However, if I've looked at it and I can tell there's no fracture, there's no blood, it's probably Jill's problem because kids have boo-boos all the time. In fact, you know what? Oftentimes, it, the boo-boo isn't the problem. It represents a problem for them. So we're gonna make believe that Jill was outside playing and she's hurt herself and her elbow. And I'm gonna be uh, three different types of parents so we can see what it looks like. The final one is what we should be trying to do more often. Okay, you ready? So I just want you to be my tween daughter and show me the boo-boo on your elbow. Watch how I respond as the parent. Go ahead. Dad, look, I fell down. I was playing outside and, and, and Let me I see. my elbow. It hurts. Oh, oh my gosh, Jill. Suck it up. But it hurts. No, Jill, I want you to go outside and play with the other kids right now. Do you understand me? And, and you know what? There's going to be a lot of other worse problems in life than a little boo-boo like that. There's no blood, get out there and play and be a big girl and knock off the whining. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the cameras to focus on me as I do these exercises because I want you to see my reaction to what's going on here, all right? So first of all, I was now a parent that was too firm and not kind, all right? So I'm gonna ask my crew and the cameras to stay on me when I do this dramatization so you can see the, the difference here and try to maybe zoom in on us a little bit. The second kind of parent might respond this way. So go ahead, Jill, one more time. Dad, I fell down outside while I was playing and I hurt my elbow. Um, um, okay, 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 okay. Honey, don't cry, don't cry, sweetheart. Um, all right, uh, Daddy's gonna bring you in the kitchen and I'm gonna wash it off and I'm gonna give you some medicine. Okay. I'll give you, oh, would you like some ice cream, honey? Will that make okay. you feel better? Okay, okay. Okay. All right, so the second kind of parent is what I call too kind and not firm. Here is the final response to a problem that their, our child owns. One more time, Jill. Ow, Dad, I fell outside while, while I was playing and I hurt my elbow. Look, looks it like, really, really hurts. It looks like it might hurt. It hurts. Yeah? Um, what do you think you can do to make that feel better? Um, um, ice? Oh, that's a good idea. How about if I get the ice out of the freezer and put it in a cloth and let you hold it on it to make it feel better? Would that work? Uh, sure. Excellent. Okay, so basically I, what I wanted to show you is the right way to respond when you have identified as a parent or a teacher as to who owns the problem and if the child owns the problem, your job is to go through those three steps. Acknowledge that it looks like something might hurt. It looks like there's a problem. Two, what can they do to solve it and be there ready to help, not do it for them. Consider that and think about that the next time that your child brings you a problem that they own. Now, we, we need a new generation of capable kids who will become capable and responsible adults. The next time you ask your child to do something she should do for herself, and she says, but I like it when you do it for me, say to your child, I know you do, and I know you can do it too. Be mindful to walk away, put earplugs in to drown out the fit, and allow your child to own her mild problem and grow. Speaking of mindful, coming up after the break, I'm going to have a conversation with a father, an educator, and an author, um, what it means for parents to be mindful. Doing so can bring about amazing abilities as a parent. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> 